There are many reasons that Doctor Who's received criticism throughout the years. Varying levels of production values can be forgiven in the grand scheme, as this was a television show in the days long before movie-like budgets like Game of Thrones. However, production aside, it's more often than not the scripts that rile people the most. With that in mind, let's get straight into it. I'm Sean Ferrick for Who Culture, and here are 10 episodes of Doctor Who that pissed people off. 10. Sleep No More Cashing in on the found footage craze of the 2000s, this Mark Gaddis pen script was meant to be a scary addition to the series, featuring creepy villains made from the dust that collects at the corner of one's eyes. All going well, a villain likes the weeping angels or the silence could have grown up from this. Instead, a highly confusing and muddled episode just served to annoy audiences. While it was daring to attempt to switch the format of the show up, the episode arrived just after the fantastic Zygon Invasion Inversion two-parter. The ninth series had been a drastic step up from the eighth, yet this episode spoiled what had been an upward trajectory. None of the supporting characters are memorable, the Doctor comes across as arrogant rather than confident, and the episode has no overall impact on Who lore or any ongoing threads. League of Gentlemen alum Reese Shearsmith, returning to the franchise after playing Patrick Troughton in An Adventure in Time and Space, plays the hero that the audience gets to know through flashback, yet not even that is enough to help viewers understand what exactly was meant to be happening. This episode was a swing and a miss for Gattis and Peter Capaldi's middle season. 9. The Twin Dilemma Colin Baker's troubles with the BBC kicked off right at the beginning. His first story, The Twin Dilemma, introduced his sixth Doctor, Though, in the early part of the episode, he grabs Perry Brown by the throat and attempts to throttle her. This act threw audiences who were already on the back foot, having just suffered the loss of Peter Davison. Davison's Doctor had been a younger, more energetic incarnation of the Time Lord, so Baker was always going to have a tough act to follow. Unfortunately, the writing for this episode left him as something of a scapegoat easily blamed for the weakness of the material he was given. Baker's time would be marred with a hiatus, inconsistent writing, and a marked increase in violence, with the last element in particular receiving backlash from audiences and the censors. The opening episode of his tenure was him strangling a loyal companion, picking awful clothes for this incarnation to wear, which Baker himself hated, and displaying a new level of arrogance that made him instantly difficult to relate to. Out of all of the introductory episodes to the various Doctors, this stands as one of the lowest rated. 8. Orphan 55 Orphan 55 sits among the lowest rated episodes of the Doctor Who revival, sandwiched between Love and Monsters and Sleep No More. The idea behind the episode is sound, with the TARDIS gang believing they're going on holiday before being plunged into a nightmare. However, with heavy-handed messages and side characters who don't really stand out at all, the episode served to annoy rather than entertain. The main issue behind this episode is the message it puts across. While the climate positive elements are commendable, the audience is beaten over the head with them, which takes away from the great reveal at the episode's close. Orphan 55 is Earth, hundreds of years in the future, with the dreg monsters being humans who were mutated by nuclear fallout. What should have been a disturbing and shocking twist feels like being overly preached at. Added to the fact that none of the unfortunates who were killed along the way are that memorable, the episode feels more like a slog rather than a strong environmental message. 7. The Timeless Children This episode absolutely blew the fandom apart when it dropped in 2020. The revelation that William Hartnell was no longer the first Doctor upset a lot of fans, with criticism levelled at Chris Chibnall for tossing almost 60 years of lore in the bin. However, the inclusion of the Timeless Child was actually tied into earlier stories as well. The Brain of Morbius, a fourth Doctor serial, is shown in clips while the Doctor is in the Matrix. There are other faces shown in that story that are retroactively now counted as different incarnations of the Time Lord. Joe Martin returns to add another sense of continuity to the episode as well. The episode did receive praise for attempting to do something different with the franchise. While the nature of the Doctor may be debated by the fans for years to come, there was actually another aspect of the episode that overshadows this revelation. The Master and Kosharmus destroy Gallifrey, meaning that the Time Lords are, once again, said to be wiped out. One of the biggest and most emotional mysteries of the revival was the Doctor's Last of the Time Lord status, which was soundly resolved in both Utopia and the Day of the Doctor. Unfortunately, this final twist falls a little flat here. 6. Doctor Who 1996 After a gap of several years, if one doesn't include the children and need special dimensions in time from 1993, Doctor Who returned as a movie in 1996, with Sylvester McCoy reprising the role for a few minutes. A shot as he exits the TARDIS, he's accidentally killed by Grace Holloway as she attempts to operate on him, triggering his regeneration into Paul McGann. Now, the movie has benefited from the years that have passed, with fans warming to McGann thanks to the ongoing Big Finish productions. However, at the time, the movie was deemed a bit 
bit of a mess. Plot elements that were included here, such as the Doctor's half-human status, only served to enrage those who'd been anxiously waiting for the next adventure in the TARDIS. The film is not awful by any means, yet it suffers from what many felt was the Americanization on display, which was a little stark in the 90s. Eric Roberts is clearly, however, having the time of his life as one of the most fabulous incarnations of the Master, while Daphne Ashbrook has some real chemistry with the Eighth Doctor. Still, with his over-the-top acting and questionable plot decisions, this movie did nothing to help the franchise, which would go on hiatus again for another nine years. Five, The Talons of Wang Chiang. The fourth Doctor serial has been described as near perfection, apart from one thing. That thing is the outdated and racist depictions of Chinese people on show throughout the serial. This has led to the show being aired with trigger warnings in place at the beginning and has also led to BBC Canada refusing it from their broadcast schedule as well. It was an odd choice of writing as there are many racial stereotypes and racist attitudes on display that the Doctor does nothing to challenge. This is out of character for him, which lends credence to the idea that it was deliberate. The Chinese immigrants in the show are depicted mostly as gang members, with the main villain resembling Fu Manchu and being played by a white actor. Quite separate from these issues, the episode also struggled with its effects. There was a laughably bad rat monster that kills any tension in the episode as well. Despite all of this, the episode has made it into the high rankings for classic Whovians. The actual script is quite strong and the plot, when it avoids offensive depiction, is sound. However, this serial in particular is an example that outdated stereotypes can consign even strong stories to the bin. 4. Dalek the Ninth Doctor's first on-screen encounter with a Dalek was polarising, as it was felt at the time that this new, more emotional monster was a far cry from the deadly creatures of previous years. Now this was of course before the reveal of Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways, when the Daleks were very much back on form. Here however, this lone Dalek has been tortured by Henry Van Staten, crying out for rescue through the stars. The TARDIS picks up the signal and homes in, only for the Time Lord to come up against his greatest foe. While the depiction of the Dalek itself was the subject of much ire, Eccleston is on peak form as he shows just how he really feels about his nemesis. The scene that really divided audiences is the Dalek's final fate, electing to sacrifice itself after seeking a moment in the sun. To be fair, it was a little left of centre to have this being of pure rage and destruction seeking comfort, no matter the scenario. While the point of the episode was to show how damaged the Doctor has become after the Time War, it did unfortunately serve to diminish the threat of the Daleks overall. At least least for a few episodes. 3. Death in Heaven Doctor Who's status as a children's show is always up for debate. Classic Who lent itself to this description, for the most part a little easier, while Revival Who is full of innuendos, violence and frightening scenes, though generally handled in child-friendly ways. Then Death in Heaven came along. The finale of the eighth season, Peter Capaldi's first, introduced horrific ideas in what happens after a person dies. The show had never depicted an afterlife that was so upsettingly stark before, though Missy's plan to reuse the dead and convert them into a cyber enemy is truly disturbing. The episode goes so far as to suggest that Missy invented the very idea of an afterlife so that, initially, people wouldn't resist her. Despite strong acting turns from Michelle Gomez, Peter Capaldi and Jenna Coleman, the episode is now remembered for its incredibly downbeat tone rather than anything else. It truly pushed the boundaries of what a show that was meant to be child-friendly could get away with on a Saturday evening. 2. The Deadly Assassin Assassin. This was the first serial to air after Sarah Jane Smith was left in Aberdeen by the Doctor and was also the first serial not to feature a travelling companion. The Doctor receives a vision from the President of Gallifrey being assassinated, though when he returns in an attempt to stop it, he himself is implicated in the murder. With returning characters like the Master and new characters like Chancellor Goth, the plot is heavily inspired by the Manchurian candidate. Mary Whitehouse, a campaigner to clean up TV, took particular issue with this story, though it was the ending of the third part that drew most of her ire. The Doctor's head is held underwater by Goth, then it cuts to black. Whitehouse argued that this would terrify the children watching, who would then spend a week not knowing if the Doctor had survived. The BBC apologised for this and actually edited the master tape so that on repeat this ending was removed. While this was a victory for censorship at the time, it also sparked the beginning of a somewhat more violent time in Doctor Who history presided over by John Nathan Turner. 1. Resurrection of the Daleks Peter Davison's only encounter with the Daleks was not met with a 
warm reception on its initial broadcast, nor has it aged well either. Described as a subpar remake of Earthshock, the serial that saw hated companion Adric die, this adventure is an unrelentingly grey, dismal affair that lacks so much in the way of fun that companion Tegan elects to leave the TARDIS by the end. If the idea was to introduce a gritty edge to the fifth Doctor and his team, the episodes both succeed and fail at the same time. While Davison is on top form as the Doctor, the return of Davros is marred by the ultra-high body count that required TV watchdogs to investigate. A recurring theme of early Doctor Who was excessive uses of violence, overpowering the stories themselves. In this case, the violence is overshadowed by poor supporting actors as well. With much of its runtime being spent on grey London docklands, there's very little to enjoy aesthetically in Resurrection, and, perhaps wisely enough, the Daleks would not return until the sixth Doctor encountered them in Revelation of the Daleks. And that's everything for our list today. If there is an episode of Doctor Who that really got under your skin, please drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Remember, you can reach out to us over on Twitter at WhoCulture. Of course, you can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Now, as always, guys, keep it wibbly wobbly. Look after yourselves and we will be back soon with another video. Thanks.